Yeah, thank you very much for staying awake. For me, it's breakfast time. Um, and it's wonderful to be back in Japan um, with all these familiar faces and friends in the audience. Um, I will um, talk a bit about deep learning as a tool for understanding things in the sciences. Um, we'll very briefly explain the tool, Leo's relevance propagation, very briefly for a minute or two, and then mainly go through application, because this is appropriate after Bob's talk, who has given us all the beauty of theory. <laughs> now now I will be easy going, okay? So, uh, I think um, some of you have seen this slide. Um, there's um, this topic of explainable AI, where you want to know what is happening in your deep learning or in your nonlinear learning machines. And uh, there's one side of the story that looks at what is happening on average for the whole ensemble, and there's the other one which looks at a single data point. So assume that you take you, you steal somebody's neural network that is really good at VOC, ImageNet, whatever, and you put in um, this animal, then um, sure enough, the model will answer, this is a rooster, it's a rooster class because it's a rooster, okay? So, and it's high classification rate, and you wonder why does this model that is a nonlinear learning machine think that this is a rooster and you would like to go backwards through this nonlinearity and explain in terms of input pixels. Okay? So here's what why the AlexNet thinks that this is a, a rooster. So you, you see that this part is important, green is unimportant, red is important. So you see that it's this part why this is considered a rooster. Okay, so that's good. So um, there's a number of methods that do this. It's only fairly recent that people have studied this. Um, and we are advocating layer-wise relevance propagation where we decompose this decision and go backwards through the model, um, conserving the relevances as we go through. And we have a theory which is called Deep Taylor. Um, so for, for those of you, so that's probably the only theory that is available on that uh, part, so it's not only an algorithm. But let's be a bit more general because a lot of things have happened. So most of you know sensitivity analysis where you just look at the gradients. So gr sensitivity analysis is not typically the thing that you want to know. And I will show you an image for that. So I'm talking about this. So time goes in this direction. So there's few early works. They, I mean, people in neural network history, we have some people that have been around for a while. They have been using sensitivity for a while. So gradients is nothing new, right? It's, it's except that, that, you know, there seems to be uh, an inability to read papers from the back in the days, at least to cite them. Um, so uh, anyway, so there's a lot of work that is going on that is extremely exciting. And uh, I will just briefly contrast these and then later on use this technique or this family of techniques for the later analysis where we get some understanding. Okay. And I hope I didn't forget anybody on the overview slide. If so, please tell me. Um, okay. So. If you want to understand what's the difference between sensitivity analysis and this layer-wise relevance propagation, so sensitivity looks at um, the question, I mean, it looks at the gradient. In other words, it asks a question, if I change a pixel somewhere here, right, on the picture, so do, do I make this more or less a car, right, if I classify to the car class? 
So in this case, of course, you see scooters. So for this picture, you need to transfer, do some transfer learning. So you want to know whether this becomes more or less a scooter. Okay? So here you see, for example, that there's a lot of stuff where there's no scooter at all. So it's just the street. And of course, it makes some sense. If you change a pixel there on the street, it's most likely to become a scooter then. Okay, so that's an important point. So LRP looks at, will discover these kind of things. So I'm just, you know, the tires, sometimes a bit of the helmet, and so on and so forth. So LRP asks the questions, what makes this scooter a scooter? Okay, so that's a different story. Sometimes people want to um, look at this question and sometimes people want to look at this question. Whatever question you ask, you need to be clear about what you're asking and then you need to use the method available. But if you use the wrong method for the right question, no good, okay? So let me just um, show you a little of bit of a video. This should be a bit entertaining. So there's some people um, that did great work on um, training uh, neural networks and AIs to play strategic games, okay? Like uh, this one, right? So that's an Atari breakout game. So here you have some DNN playing and we are analyzing online what the DNN is looking at, what, what, is, what is important for the DNN in this particular case. So this is sensitivity analysis, and this is the LRP thing. And just, if you look at it, then you can actually learn about what strategy these models have learned and how they can analyze things. So in other words, you have a tool, it's like a scientific tool with which you can measure things, which with, it, with which you can analyze things, and so, you know, you can try to understand whether these models that, that are playing are actually have learned something meaningful, strategic, or not. Okay? Um, let me move to a slightly more uh, scientifically different topic. Okay? So, whether or not a strategic game is played well or not, that's of course, you know, for AI research, this has utmost importance. But it's, if you can classify cancer well and contribute to the understanding of cancer, then it is some life and death thing, right? So we should be very clear about what our models do. So this is unpublished work with a lot of authors. And this is a <laughs> some work that we have been following for about six years and not publishing about it. No archive papers. <laughs> it's really old school, right? <laughs> so we still haven't published, but we're working on it very hard. And, and there's this thing maybe people have forgot. Um, there's referees, okay? And they, you know, give you a hard time, so you have to fight with them. Okay, so what is the idea here? So you have a pathological slides. Um, this is breast cancer. And it has this funny c color because it's, it has been stained. And um, what we do, or what we intend to do, is we want to classify um, and diagnose with this slides whether this is cancer or not. So typically, if you are an MD, you look at this and say, oh, this is breast cancer, right? Because it's breast cancer. So, and you don't segment things. You just look at it holistically. You look at it through your microscope, and that's it, right? Then you say it's breast cancer. Or, you know, you look at it through the microscope, and then you call the surgery room and say, sorry, guys, you have to continue cutting because it's in the middle of the surgery. Okay, so if we try to solve this kind of problem with machine learning, we do the following. So 
we take little tiles um, because this is a, you know, these are super large image if they are uh, di digitized. Um, so you need, need to take smaller images. It's unfeasible to take the full image. Then within each tile, you make a classification. Note that you only have a label for the whole thing. You don't have any segmentation. Okay, so then um, you classify, and then there are some areas which are clearly cancerous to your learning machine, and some where you have no clue, and <coughs> some, some where this is actually speaking against something, and so on and so forth. So, and now, remember, we have a tool with, with which we, we can go backwards, right? And ask what are the pixels that are important for our classification. This is, of course, not a rooster, but we can look at it, and it looks a bit like that, okay? So these are the cancerous, the things that our machine considers cancerous, okay? So, so far so good. Um, you can now start judging whether this is good or bad, and uh, it takes uh, an MD and a pathologist, and Frederik Klauschen, he's a pathologist in our project. So, so far so good. So you have learned a map from the pathological slice, the stained image, to a classification, okay? And now you go backwards and you get this map. Okay. So far, so good. And you can classify different things. So you can classify towards cancerous cells. You can uh, classify towards tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or stoma, or anything. Um, so if you look at the slice, this is how it comes. And then you look at the uh, classification of cancer and non-cancer, and then you can put things on top of each other. Okay, so you, so you see that we, ha we have been coloring this slice that came from a staining with our computational coloring, okay? And in this way, we are assisting the pathologist. So we're not replacing the pathologist. This will never happen, I think, uh, so far because these people have the responsibility. So they, they will be sued if they are wrong. And they, they also have the responsibility if somebody dies. Okay, so now we can play another game. So, so far, this has been just a classification uh, a problem. But, and we have been classifying cancer, non-cancer, stroma, tumor infiltrating, lymphocytes, and so on and so forth. So that's this part, okay? But there's also molecular uh, markers. So in some data sets, you have for every um, of these slices, you have about 60,000 molecular markers, gene expression, somatic mutations, copy number variations, and so on and so forth. Of course, you can play the same game again. You can predict every single one of these classes. You can regress or classify, and you can apply the same technique that I just showed to you. So then you get maps for all these, these, and most of the time your classification really sucks. Why? Because most of these gene expressions have absolutely nothing to do with the cancer. Right? But some of them you can actually classify well. And for those, you can look at these maps and start actually putting together the maps from molecular features and um, the classifications from morphological things. So you can put these things together. So by the way, this has not been done before, okay? just to let you know. So, and in a way, this is all done in the computer. So we submitted a paper, and sure enough, people said, this is all nice and good, and you do your cross-validation games, and you check everything you do out of sample, whatnot. But we don't believe it. 
right? So that's, of course, the problem if you um, inter interact in an interdisciplinary environment. Okay, and uh, so w one, one of the interesting things is, of course, in a in out of these 60,000, um, perhaps, you know, for certain cancer types, there's mm, between 50 and 150 that we can predict well, more or less well, okay? So all the rest is not really predictable for good reasons. But if you now go to literature and cancer research, you know that for most of these molecular profiles, you have maybe knowledge about one or two dozen of these molecular markers for the different cancers uh, as, as mechanisms that are clear, right? So, so you can start, you know, deriving from that, or deriving is said too much, associating to that, from that, um, drivers of cancer. Okay, so now um, you can look at what associates of these molecular marker, what associates most to the tumor cells, to the lymphocytes, to the stroma, and you can, you can do some association and cluster analysis and look at these uh, molecular markers and do these kind of nice plots. And you can actually find that, you've, you actually find some of the markers that are known um, in this analysis. So that's good, so that's a validation. But then again, you know, there's these, these uh, referees that want you to validate, which means, um, so here this is a cadherin that is one of the molecular markers that is uh, associated with cancer. And so you uh, have low and high, uh, so these are two slices uh, that are low expression and high expression. This is our prediction, okay? And by the way, the prediction cannot be done on the same slice. Why? Because you've been using it already. You have stained this, okay? So you have to take the next slice. So the, the uh, tumor has changed uh, just a bit, so just slightly. Okay, so now, since this thing there's also an antibody staining to that. We can take the next slice that is available and do the staining and compare it with our prediction. So the nice thing is that it compares well. So for a, biological, um, uh, for a biologist, this is a very good prediction. So in other words, what we find is actually with our technique, we find something that is quite reasonable and that you would, at least in the cases that we looked at, also find when you do the antibody staining. So that's quite nice because it, it, it allows you to do this molecular prediction game and get some insights about distributions and correlations to morphology. So that's quite interesting. What, what, did, what did the colors mean? Oh, these, these are just levels of, uh, uh, and, and so, so maybe i just go back because I, so blue is predictive, uh, some molecular uh, uh, features, then this is green is stoma, and this is carcinoma cells. These are different color. Okay, so, so in this case, explaining is really essential. Um, we have a tool that allows us to derive a hypothesis about the molecular drivers, and we have validated it. And of course, it, there's, you know, we, c we can start now using this tool and perhaps, you know, include it into clinical trials and everything. So that's the starting point of, of something that will go on for, you know, beyond my retirement. I, assume, right? But hopefully it will be a, like a small step in helping to understand this better. Okay, so now we're <laughs> for something completely different. Okay? So other sciences.
Okay. Um, I've been working on this for seven years now. So my training is um, originally um, quantum field theory, string theory, so I, I'm a trained quantum mechanician. So, and I will use machine learning in quantum mechanics. So the very short story is, um, in 2011, I spent my sabbatical at uh, UCLA, at IPAM. Very nice place, very sunny, good weather. And I was the only machine learning dude in a computational chemistry and physics program. Okay? And they talked about solving the Schrodinger equation. So this is Schrodinger and his equation, which is this is the Hamiltonian, this is the wave function, this is the energy. So it's basically describing the properties of molecules or materials. So uh, unfortunately, this is really a beast. So you cannot solve this nicely. You can only approximately solve it. So what people do is they apply DFT, which is not discrete Fourier transform, but density functional theory, and it got some Nobel Prizes. And for a small innocent molecule, a reasonable approximation in DFT takes about five hours of computing time. A more adventurous one, about seven days okay, per molecule. So it's not a data-rich place, just to clarify. So what I suggested was to use machine learning instead of doing this approximation to treat the whole problem, the equation, as a stochastic problem and just predict the outcome of the equation, which was uh, quite heretic and still is. And um, for this, of course, if you are a machine learner, you need to have a representation. So this is a molecule. It, has, it comes with a coordinate of every atom and a nuclear charge. And if you want to represent it, you can, for example, represent it as the Coulomb interaction between the i-th and j-th atom, and then you get a matrix, okay? So you compare two, two molecules by just taking the Frobenius norm. So this is a very simple representation that we came up with. There's many others. This is an active field now. Um, with uh, two years ago, only in the US, there were 10 workshops on that. So um, uh, <laughs> when we did this in 2011, I thought we need to take the dumbest model that we can think of and make this work. So in other words, we take a kernel ridge regression model with a Gaussian kernel, put in all the training data. So we have done, or in fact, Alex Kachenko is doing 7,000 molecules on the Max Planck supercomputer. We took 1,000 out of them, forgot the rest, and just trained a kernel ridge regression model on it, uh, which is a matrix inversion that is going like that on anybody's computer. And then, we got some quite nice results. So about 10 kcal per mole, which is, was okay and got us a FISREF letter. Then we used neural networks and got this down. And then we are, we are 2015, we were at a 1 kcal. Now we're way below 1 kcal. Chemists are happy if we reach chemical accuracy, which is 1 kcal. So the difference of this kind of calculation out of sample is that we take fractions of a millisecond instead of five hours or seven days, right? So that's quite nice. And it's, it's working out of sample, that's the nice thing. So now let's be more adventurous in neural networks. So um, early last year we thought, well, why not do something like um, word to vec but just for chemistry. So in word to vec you are taking the complex nonlinear relationship in the, in the language, in the grammar, um, to embed words in, its, in their context. So here we are, we are building a so-called tensor neural network to embed atoms in a, in a molecule 
into the respective chemical environment of a certain atom. Okay? So in other words, first thing is that we take, the, we, we have again the differences between the i's and, and j's atom in the molecule. We put this in and we represent this. So we take, have a density estimator there. Then um, we, have, we add some kind of in interaction environment, um, which is the uh, tensor layer. And then we do this several times. So we have the atomic environment, then we have the interaction environment, then we have um, you know, three, mol uh, three atom environments, and so on and so forth. So if you're just you know, iterating this block, so, so for every atom, there's this block. So if you have a large molecule, it will go over here. And then um, you know, we take this as an input to the next layer that looks exactly like that. And so we have some weight sharing. OK. So far, so good. So in last NIPS, we had the Schnett. Okay. And because what we realized is if we are if we're taking images and doing computer vision, then um, this is pixelized. Okay, so but if we are taking molecules, and for example we do molecular dynamics, these molecules they are you know changing very slightly, and you know every you know coordinate change matters. So you cannot just you know, roughly look at the atom positions. So we cannot use the same techniques, the same filters and as in computer vision. So we, are, we have been, in, in usually in computer vision for your convolutive neural networks, you have some discrete filters. Um, so this is a filter for the, this atom. And so uh, this would be the parameter tensor of, of, from this um, um, atom. And um, we, we suggested to take a continuous filter. Okay, so with this, um, you can actually, um, you know, you have these these uh, continuous uh, um, filter generating networks, and um, with this, you can start predicting again energies, and you can predict all sorts of other molecular properties. It works well. Um, Ah, this is the Google result. Um, then you can also take this and apply it to materials. The difference between a molecule and a material is that materials have continued, I mean, they, are, they go on forever, so you need some uh, periodic filters if you generate them because you have the unit cells. So. If you ha don't have priority boundary conditions, for example, for molecules, these filters that you generate with your network, and this is a slice through the filter, um, they look like that. But if you have periodic boundary uh, uh, condition and you have diamond-shaped uh, materials, then you know what the neural network learns is a representation like that, or in graphite like that. Which, of course, if you're a material scientist, make your heart beat fast. And you're happy, right? Because this is the way it should look. And of course, we have very ac excellent accuracy um, in predicting energies and everything. Plus, we can do molecular dynamics at super high accuracy. Plus, since we can do molecular dynamics, we can actually um, do molecular dynamics for some beasts that are called fullerenes. Okay, so that's the C20 structure. Okay, so if you would do this in the conventional way, you would spend something like seven years of computing time, okay, to get a trajectory. We can spend something, I mean, which is not, you know, so by the way, we are not having the resources of Google or Facebook or, or our other friends, so this is like a, very modest computational unit where we spend about seven hours. It actually runs on the laptop, okay? And then, of course, MD means that we are looking at molecules that are vibrating, that are moving. 
And so you can look at the vibration spectra, you can look at all sorts of things, and um, you can look whether the estimation of the spectra coincides with chemistry and with the things that you measure in the experiment. And nicely it does. So then, what are the insights? Because all of this, what I've been talking about, is just prediction. We can predict energies well. We can predict forces well, because that's what you need for molecular dynamics. So what can we learn? What has the model learned? You already saw these plots. And these are the plots for, for uh, molecules. We call them the gummy bear plots, for obvious reasons. So um, basically, after you've trained your model, you have a neural network that reflects chemistry in some sense. And then you want to know what sense, OK? So you could put a test charge into this neural network and then get something like a local chemical potential at each place. So you can just scan this, and then you get these plots. And um, the nice thing about this is you can scan all sorts of things. So you can put a test charge of a single certain atom, like a carbon atom, hydrogen atom. But you can also put a test charge of a group or something like that. Where would this bind? What, what would it do? And so on and so forth. And then you can ask, well, if you um, think about all these different materials, materials, they, they're made of different atoms, um, then um, these atoms in, in chemistry, they come in these groups, right? So how does the neural network group these groups? OK, so that's a, that's a PCA plot about how, how the neural network groups them. It actually does group them. So that's quite interesting. The groups have come to existence because people have discovered some, some centuries ago that they have similar properties. But this neural network has not learned. They, the, the neural network just learned to predict energies. It doesn't learn about chemistry. It did learn about bindings, about polarization, and all that. And so it learned about chemistry. We can find some chemical insight, even chemical insight that is not in our databases. So just to conclude this part, so we can have the tensor neural network, or SNET, which is a variant, which is a convolutive neural network, which can generalize across chemical compound space. This is materials and molecules, and also do molecular dynamics at a very high accuracy. Um, we can you know, predict things of interest, um, and we can get insights like uh, how, how the cross-element generalization is and uh, local chemical potentials in quotes and so on and so forth. So I conclude my talk by reminding you that explaining models is important. It's orthogonal to improving neural networks, but it's actually quite useful for improving them. And I think you've said that before in the morning. So. Um, it's very important to open the black box for the sciences because uh, you know, we have to take some responsibility for our methods. So LRP is a new theory uh, that I point you to. Um, applications have been on cancer analysis and quant quantum chemistry. I forgot to delete this part. Didn't have time for this. So my goal is actually to achieve some insight and understanding with which we can push forward the knowledge in these application domains. Thank you very much for your attention. So we're a little bit out of time. Uh, but uh, while the speaker sets up, maybe we can have one question. For the Schrodinger equation, so is it easy to verify that the solution is correct? Um, is it, if you have a solution, is it easy to verify, or a proposed solution, is it easy to verify the, the error in the solution? Or yes, of course. I mean, you just need to do the quantum chemical calculation. And that's, that and that's it, right? So just seven days' time or five days' time. But, but these, so, or, or which, which part of the, I mean, so if you predict the energy or, 
from Volumo or something like that. And then if you have a proposed solution, what, uh, how easy is it to check if it's uh, correct or what's the error in the, in the equation? Ah, okay, so, so the error, uh, it depends on the level of the uh, calculation. So you have, uh, in, in the, the not so accurate methods, you're plus minus um, 2k cal. So it's actually lower than this accuracy. But if you take the higher level calculation where, where the error is much smaller, you can see that this prediction is actually very accurate. Okay. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you.